So towards the end of these interviews, I like to do a lightning round where I list a series of people or ideas and have my guests respond to each item in one minute or less. Are you down? Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, visit our website at nonserviummedia.com. If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word. And so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to a bonus episode. Last year, we made a lightning round compilation for 2019, and this year we wanted to do the same. So I've collected all of the lightning rounds that we did for 2020 and put them all together in one video for you. Thank you all so much for continuing to support Nonservian Media as a project. So without further ado, here's a compilation of the lightning rounds of 2020. Yeah, well, if you go over the minute, the anarchist cops are, are on their way. <laughs> Left unity. Partial oppose. Largely oppose. <laughs> I'm extremely into factionalism, but also am capable of being realist about, like, not dying. That's it. <laughs> okay, so not a fan of gulags, I guess. <laughs> no. I, I, okay, I, cer cool. I certainly... Uh, don't really advocate for, I don't really consider Gulag supporters to be leftist, so I don't consider that left unity. Alex Jones. Oh, love him. Best friend. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd say that. <laughs> you and your info wars. It is, it, it, there's a war for our brains. <laughs> No, there's there's old videos of Alex Jones like yelling at FBI agents and I was like, Jones, I hate you, don't make me love you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one. Russia Gate. Like the Kremlin, as differentiated from Russian people in general, has a very dangerous geopolit geopolitical structure that's exercised by primarily by its intelligence agencies, but also by its military overall. That being said, when US Democrats blame um, US white supremacy on Russia, even if Russia is actively supporting neo-Nazis in the US, it misses the point entirely. So it's important that we recognize threats without like surrendering our own responsibility. Bernie Sanders. It sucks that he kind of believes in machine guns at the border socialism in the sense of like a social safety net for citizens but he's gone on record saying you know that latin americans are too poor to enter the u.s and stuff like that which is just like aside from being proto-fascist just like false and weird um also it sucks that he opposes sex workers in in pretty profound ways but he's definitely harm reduction in a million other areas and i think it would be much easier to obviously much easier to leverage him than to like leverage Trump around certain issues. Reputation markets. I think that reputation systems are just things that already exist and are helpful for building trust, which is the basic ingredient for coordination. And so they're really important, but they're also really dangerous in the wrong hands or if they're centralized in, in bad ways. So I think that we need to be aware of how they work for doing commons problems, but I'm also very skeptical of how a lot of them are rolled out. That was Emmy Bevancy. The audio came from our first interview of 2020. You can check out the entire interview at nonserviummedia.com or at youtube.com slash nonserviummedia. This next lightning round comes from our interview with Zachary Woodman. Carl Schmidt. 
intriguing fascists who should be read and engaged with, probably the deepest critic of liberalism ever, and he's also very deeply cursed. Equality of authority. Very obvious moral truth to me. Okay. Nietzsche. Oh, I can't do this in a minute. Come on. Okay, so... (laughs) I'm making you Twitter post. Deeply influential over me for a variety of reasons. His criticism of Christianity and genealogy, I think, are must-read history of Western philosophy stuff. He had very flawed thoughts, too. He obviously denied the equality of authority fundamentally. His talk of higher and lower people I, I strikes me as a liberal and problematic. But he's a frickin' joy to read. Um, he has a lot of important thoughts uh, and a lot of problematic thoughts, too, including, like, sexism and stuff like that. Be very careful reading him. He's very easy to misread. Uh, and don't trust any scholarship on him prior to, like, 1960 when he was read as, like, a Nazi. Public choice theory. Very influential over my thought. I think it forms the foundation of one of the theoretical foundation of one of the biggest critiques anarchists should have of the state, which is it's that um, uh, state actors don't act in the public interest, they act in their own self interest. People should study it. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Kierkegaard. It's been a long time since I read him, so my thoughts might be off, um, but I fundamentally agree with Camus' critique of him that he commits philosophical suicide by just embracing religion in the face of the absurd. Populism. Uh, the Dunning-Kruger of politics. <laughs> Decision theory. Uh, I have it listed in my CV as a research interest area, so a lot of thoughts here. But <laughs> for the most part, the belief desire model is probably or the standard model of like probability decision making and so on. And so on as a normative theory is probably correct. Uh, how how do you answer that? How do you just respond to like a topic like that in one minute? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the point. <laughs> that's what makes these lightning rounds fun anyways. Causal decision theory is correct. Bayesian probability and updating is probably the correct theory about how you should form your your beliefs. And yeah, that's it. How sure are you of that? I, I, I'll admit I'm biased because, first of all, I have an, like, an econ background. And I think that a lot of that... Give me a percentage. <laughs> I see the joke. A lot of that stuff is sort of integral to like mainstream economic choice theory. And also the the professor I did most of the studying with that on that was James Joyce at University of Michigan. He's sort of the main defender of those views. So I might be biased, but um, I would probably say that my credence is somewhere in the neighborhood of 85%. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Leo Strauss. Oh, um... I don't know much about him proper, but I know quite a bit about the type of people he's influenced. And I'm my first inclination is to be quite skeptical. The esoteric reading strikes me as oftentimes like weird conspiracy theory for intellectual history, um, even though it's sometimes correct that uh, I think political esotericism happened quite a bit, especially early in the Enlightenment. The whole approach to like natural rights strikes me as just table pounding and not very interesting argumentation. And then the West Coast Straussians, like the Jaffites and the people at Hillsdale I used to run with, are deeply cursed. And a lot of that scholarship is very shoddy, in my opinion. From the 18th episode of the show, here's Joe Picot. First on the list is illegalism. I like it more in concept than in practice. I think, like I mentioned, the Bonnet Gang, Bono Gang, and again, I can't remember the dude's name in Italy, was robbing the, the jewelry stores. This sort of Robin Hood feel to it, I like, but it's not something I'm going to go out and do. Antinomianism. Um, I think antinomianism inspired Garrison and also Ian Hutchinson back in um, colonial Boston days, who got thrown out of Massachusetts for speaking truth to power. Uh, but Get that Garrison's anarchism was informed by antinomianism. So I think it's good shit. Radical fairies. I don't like this mystical piece of it. I mean, Jason Rogers is the guy who mentioned it. I think, I don't know if there was a Lefty in Christianity article or something else. That was him, not me, who brought them up. Um, I know some of the, you know, the fag rag folks and the radical fairies kind of overlapped a bit, but... I much prefer the fag rag, you know, confrontational approach to this, you know, hippy dippy stuff. The affinity group. Affinity groups, I think, are fine if there's true affinity, but in fact, they were just sort of organizational cells often. 
I wasn't part of Clamshell, but back in the day, the Clamshell Alliance was organized back in Massachusetts, which was the anti-nuke group, was organized on the basis of affinity groups. And they weren't, people weren't yet together based on affinity. They had to be a certain number and you got assigned to an affinity group. So I think if they're true, small, like-minded groups of people working together on a project, fine. But generally it's a, it's a, it's labeled for something that's not really based on affinity. It's called an affinity group as an organizational unit. Robert Anton Wilson. I love the dude. The Illuminatus, fabulous book. I've read some of his hippy dippy mystical stuff and even that I like for coming from him because of the way he plays with it. He's great on drugs. He's oh, he was always on drugs, but I meant <laughs> writing about drugs. I never met him in person. I, there is a VHS tape floating around of a conference that he's interviewed on that a friend of mine was also in. And he, and he also is, um, Robin Anton Wilson explains the world. There's a few tapes and videos out about him and he's fabulous. Excellent. Yeah, we got the we got the name non servium from uh, the Illuminatus trilogy. You know where that came from? It's I, I do. <laughs> James Joyce and then the Old Testament before that. Right, right. It's 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 what Lucifer said when he was being thrown out of heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Robert Anton Wilson got it from James Joyce. James Joyce got it from the Old Testament. The quote is attributed to Lucifer, which was thought to be, the translation was, I will not serve, but there's actually another translation, which was, I will not transgress, which coincidentally makes two pretty good principles for anarchism right off the bat. Huh. I didn't know about that ultimate. I, I know about that I will not serve. Good. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, next one on the list, two more, by the way, Discordianism. I'm intrigued by it. it. I mean, there's overlap between Robert Anton Wilson and Discordianism, and there's some other anarchists who were involved in it too. I can't remember, I can't remember who wrote Principia Discordia. It is good stuff. The whole Emperor Norton story is just a great story, which is that I learned about through the Principia, through the Discordians. Um, they sort of were insurrectionists in some ways. I mean, they, they, these temporary autonomous zones and things were all. We, they didn't use the same words that Wilson uses, but sort of temperamentally, they were similar to some of these later ideas. You know, I didn't take it seriously. I mean, in Mago Adler's book, Drawing Down the Moon, actually has a chapter on it, taking it seriously as a pagan faith. And I don't know whether people really did it. I didn't really know any of the people personally. Well, it's supposed to be a joke pretending to be a religion or a religion pretending to be a joke, right? Exactly. You know, and, and Margaret did a good job, he did a good job on the chapter, but it was kind of, I, I assumed it was always a joke pretending to be a religion, but it probably, <laughs> who the hell knows, right? Noam Chomsky. I mean, the reverence which people give to him is just amazing. I went to this talk in Boston years ago. It was Chomsky spoke, a couple of other people spoke. There was a film about Aung San Suu Kyi when she was one of the good guys back in the day. And they, they had him speak first. And once he spoke, 75% of the people left. It was like, you know, like his his roadies at the thing. I mean, he, he's just regarded as near godlike uh, in the left, especially in Boston. But in the anarchists as a general seem to be very reverent, rever reverential towards him. But he's a me fuck. I mean, I, he spoke at Black Rose one time. Him and Howard Zinn was speaking. And Howard Zinn kind of says he's an anarchist sometimes, he says he's a Marxist other times. He's dead now, but he was basically a decent man, though. He was he, nice. And somebody asked Chomsky a question from the audience, and not a mean question. She was some sort of pacifist, I think. Sounded like she might have been religious-based. And he fucking laid into her in a very, very mean way. And I've heard stories about the way he treats his students in class and stuff, too. And he's just, he's just kind of a dick. Um, and I also think, he, what kind of fucking anarchist writes articles encouraging people to vote? It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> All right, last one is Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day. I think Dorothy Day was great. I think the Catholic workers do incredible work. Um, not work I would want to do, for sure. Um, but they put their money where their mouth is, as it were. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I, I don't know them well. I went to a talk by some of the folks from the Catholic Worker, the Saints Therese and Francis Catholic Worker House in Worcester, Massachusetts. And for instance, he sent his kids to public school and talked about why, and lots of people do. I'm not criticizing him for that, but they're very thoughtful about everything they do. And he didn't just automatically send his kids to school, even though that's where he arrived. 
because they have this essential critique of the state. They were truly, most of them truly are anarchists and, and Dorothy Day certainly was. And so they do these, these houses of hospitality, as I'm sure you know, and they live among the homeless people themselves. They, they own the house, obviously, and there's probably some mechanism for keeping people out. So it's not totally democratic, I imagine, but they do come pretty damn, damn close to being, you know, very egalitarian project. And they, they, their religious stuff is fucking weird to me, though. I don't get why Dorothy Day could have such a complete critique of the state and capitalism. I mean, they won't put their money in a bank because it draws interest and interest is banned by the Bible because it's usury. They won't get tax free status so that people who do donate to them can't get a break on it. They just they try to minimize any involvement they have with the state, short of sending the public school, obviously. So I think they're legit anarchists, but you know, why Dorothy Day cares what the fucking Pope says when she doesn't care what the president says is beyond me. I see the connection. I mean, I think the Church of the Acts of the Apostle, which is kind of how they view them as the golden days of the church, mm -hmm. is not what the Catholic Church is today. So I don't, it's bizarre shit that they can put these two crazy ideas in their head. They're also anti-abortion, but they're not, they don't support abortion laws either because they're anarchists, so. From our episode on police abolition, here is the great Nathan Goodman. Lysander Spooner. A brilliant abolitionist, hero of the 19th century, did great work to displace the state and show that it's unnecessary by doing things like building an alternative postal service that routed around the postal monopoly, advocated direct action to support slave revolts, and wrote extensively on individualist anarchism. He was wrong on intellectual property, but he was right about so much else. Absolute hero. Okay. Queer liberation. So queer liberation is vitally important, and it's crucially tied to anarchism. The modern queer liberation movement started with the Stonewall riots, started with people fighting back against police, and queer liberation movements are still a vital site of anarchist resistance, whether that's Black and Pink's prisoner support work, or the Audre Lorde Project's Safe Outside the System Collective, or numerous other projects built by queer people, trans people, and especially people of color in those communities. Hayek. Friedrich Hayek was a brilliant social scientist who helped us understand social cooperation from the bottom up and social learning, the role of knowledge in decision making and how a central planner can't use all the knowledge that other people have. In his most recent book on Friedrich Hayek, Peter Betke refers to Hayek's research program as a sort of epistemic institutionalism. So studying how institutions or rules influence how we can use knowledge. And while Hayek wasn't an anarchist, I think anarchists have a lot to learn from him and he's crucial to a successful anarchist project. Revolution. Um, so revolution involves massive collective action problems. People can overcome those collective action problems whether revolution is the best way to displace and replace the state depends on what we mean. I'm wary of revolution to some extent due to just the dangers of widespread warfare. And so I'm more favorable towards building the new world in the shell of the old. But it also shows the capacity of people to cooperate without a state coordinating them. And in fact, against a state that is trying to suppress their ability to coordinate. Peace economics. A lot of my work is in defense and peace economics, so studying how people can achieve and sustain peace and resist violence in their lives. And so some of this means studying how the state's militaries work and how those state's militaries brutalize people. And some of this involves studying how conditions of peace can be sustained and how they can lead to a greater degree of cooperation and flourishing for all people. This next one was taken from the 20th episode of the show where I spoke with Reverend Banjo about communist anarchism, music, and religion. Organizationalism. Yeah, um, putting the cart before the horse. Please expand. Okay. <laughs> Not sure if I can in one minute, but yeah, organizationalism is sort of... I'm not against organization. A lot of people think I am. I'm for organization, mostly temporary organizations for a specific purpose. But a lot of people seem to have the idea that you're going to create an organization and then decide what it's going to do. It's a solution looking for a problem. Okay. All right. Primitivism. 
Primitivism is something I'm really interested in because mostly just because I've never seen anything quite so divisive. A lot of people are really into it. A lot of people absolutely hate it. I'm sort of in the middle because I think the critique is good in a lot of ways, but I'm not sure about the solutions. Communization. Communization. Yeah, that's been a buzzword in the last couple of years, and it's usually linked to groups like Takoon and EndNotes. They both have their strengths and weaknesses, but as for me, I just think communization, I prefer to think of it as the actual process of enacting communism. You could almost make it a synonym of expropriation. A word that we've both used multiple times in this interview so far, libertarianism. Libertarianism for me has always just meant the opposite of authoritarianism, which admittedly isn't that useful. I've shied away from it in recent years because a lot of people, again, associate it with the Libertarian Party. I wish we could take it back. I think it's going to take a while. All right. Aragorn. Uh, yeah, rest in peace. He, w- he was a really nice guy. I didn't know him well. We talked every now and again, and he published that review of uh, Jacob Blumenfeld's book on Sterner in The Anvil. Every time we talked, he was really, really nice, which was surprising to me because he had a very prickly reputation, but I miss him a lot. Yeah. The Grateful Dead. The bane of my existence for a while. (laughs) Um, (laughs) This is more of an issue when I was still performing, which is obviously on hold due to the coronavirus and when I was busking especially because that was a lot of people's only reference point for old time music and I'd be playing all these folky songs and it never failed. Someone would ask me, do you know any dead? <laughs> and the only grateful, de- the only grateful dead song I know is friend of the devil. And anytime I played it, they'd be like, Oh, that's so overplayed. And I'm like, what do you people want? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. In Texas, the go-to always seems to be something like, uh, y'all know any Skinner? Ugh. <laughs> It's even worse. Man alive. Joining us from the city where non-Servium media began and from where we recorded our second series called Anarchy in Austin, here's Antonio Bueller. Alex Jones. A a joker, uh, an an enabler of fascist ideology, takes people who who want to be contrarian and takes them down absurd conspiracy uh, rabbit holes. I think that he does more to support the efforts of the CIA than any any member of the CIA because he, he gets people to focus on the most absurd stupidity and it allows everyone to just blow off anyone who ever has any critiques of what the government m- might actually be doing. Just completely problematic. Red guards. Um, same. Completely <laughs> problematic. Uh, uh, just so, so many people in this world just want to find a cult to be a part of that has all the answers and that allows them to feel like they're fighting the revolution and I just it is a cult they're toxic and they do great harm and and I'm glad that leftists have recognized the harm that they do and that they that they don't play with them anymore uh, red cops are still bastards just want to throw that out there yeah um, Garrett Foster I, I a hero I think that he put his life on the line as all protesters are doing. Um, They may not realize it, but they're putting their lives at risk. Uh, He was consistent. He had been out there for, I believe, 50 straight days. He believed Black Lives Matter. He believed that policing was um, an institution that was inherently harmful. I I didn't know him personally, but I think that I think he's a hero and I think it's a I think it's disgusting how people are trying to slander him in death, considering the fact that he was a victim of a murder. Personally, I still like Curb Your Enthusiasm more than Seinfeld, to be honest. From the 22nd episode of the show, here's Corey Massimino. Batman or Superman? Um, Well, Batman. I prefer Batman. 
But Batman and Superman are both probably my favorite fictional characters. Uh, I think they almost kind of represent two sides of the human condition, like two sides of a spectrum. Um, you know, one is aspirational, one is I don't want to be fucking tortured and fucked up like that guy. And uh, I think there's a reason they're so resonant and, and, and long-standing and continue to be reinterpreted for new cultures and new times. I've read, I've read comics and watched movies of them since I was very little, so... I really quite enjoy those characters, um, but I find Batman generally more interesting. Rand Paul. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, blah. <laughs> no, nothing, just just emotive response. Blah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, another comparison. Seinfeld or Curb Your Enthusiasm? So I like Seinfeld. Seinfeld is definitely my favorite sitcom. I like Curb. Um... I, I like Curb. It just has a little different of a feel. It's not as consistently funny to me. But Curb, Curb's also good. But I don't think you can really beat Seinfeld. I think um, Seinfeld is really consistently funny. And um, even as it changed over the years, uh, it changed kind of style with different writers and showrunners. But um, but yeah, big fan of Seinfeld. That, that show always makes me laugh. So <sighs> Hurts my feelings to hear you choose that. But <laughs> I'll, I'll let you have it. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand is overrated by people who like Ayn Rand and underrated by people who don't like Ayn Rand. And she is one of the most inspirational writers of freedom um, and flourishing that I've ever read. And also one of the writers who said some of the stupidest shit I've ever read, like about like gender and the nuclear bomb and the Middle East. Just completely uh, stupid, but some good stuff there, in my opinion. All right, two more. Second to last, the Libertarian Party. Um, I don't know. Maybe they're net good. They're maybe they're net good. I mean, they get nominally the libertarian ideas more attention, so that's, that's probably good, right? They're better than conservative and liberal ideas by far. So, but libertarians would probably be better without a party. I don't know. It's almost ironic wanting to use the government to make the world more libertarian. Okay, last one. Camus. Camus, another uh, favorite writer of mine um, who really, I think, speaks to the human condition and, and freedom or lack thereof. And I liked it. It's, it's funny you brought up Camus just after just a few bit after Rand. I think there's this poetic symbiosis to them. I like reading Camus when I'm a little down and I like reading Rand when I'm a little up. Um, I think there's a poetic symmetry to their careers because... They're both known for, both of their central, most remembered four works are Greek myths, Sisyphus and Alice. And um, not only that, the imagery of Sisyphus and Alice are themselves kind of poetic mirrors with Sisyphus rolling the boulder up the hill and Alice lifting a boulder, you know, the world above his head entirely. I don't think their philosophies are like completely reconcilable or anything, but I think there's a lot of value to be gleaned from, from, from them um, as writers and, and philosophers. From the 23rd episode of the show where we discuss firearm freedom and free speech, here's Kelly Wright. Ronald Reagan. Boo. Um, it's really <laughs> funny though, like I think about, I kind of explained at the beginning of this about my intellectual journey. Um, and yeah, around, maybe around 10 years ago exactly, I can, I can envision a picture of me in my sophomore dorm room where I was wearing a, a Reagan Bush 84 t-shirt that my uncle got me. Um, and so that should kind of show you kind of how far I've come, um, where maybe like, yeah, like 10 years ago, I was kind of like sympathetic to like the Tea Party movement and I identified as a Republican. But yeah, I mean, over time, I very much like I've learned more. Um, we spoke of quite a bit about Reagan kind of breathing life into the gun control movement. Um, but yeah, yeah, not a fan. Grimes. Oh, Grimes the artist. I mean, come on. Um, my, I mean, my cat after her. Um, I'm yeah, I've, I've been obsessed with Grimes the artist for a few years now. Um, I think she's like a musical prodigy. I've described her, and this might be selling her a little short, but I've described her as like my generation's Bjork. I don't know, I just, yeah, I love her to death. I need my cat after her, so that should speak volumes. <laughs> I'm a little weirded out by like the Elon Musk stuff, but I think it's pretty clear that he's dating down in that situation. Yeah. Um, John Brown. 
Oh, John Brown. Um, yeah, I'm a fan of John Brown. I wish I knew more. When I think about John Brown, I remember um, when I lived in D.C., within D.C. is actually Frederick Douglass's house that he lived in um, later in life. And I went on two tours there because it's so cool in the five years that I lived there. And before you go on the tour, they take you into this little theater and they, they show you this like really cheesy acted kind of dramatization of Frederick Douglass's life. And they have a little interaction with John Brown before he goes to raid Harper's Ferry. And yeah, I, don't, I mean, I'm not like super well read on him and, and the events that surround him. I, but I am, I'm obviously in favor of, people who were invested enough in taking up arms against the institution of slavery. Um, and I wish more people knew about him. And I think there's probably parallels for how people, how he was treated and was eventually proven correct in the years that followed and how some people are being treated today in the vilification of anti-fascists and kind of people have been warning of the, the path we're on in our country. Emma Goldman. Um, I, I picked up her memoir, a couple years ago through the recommendations of a friend and it is it's incredible um it's an autobiography so it's her own work it's about her own life um and emma goldman i mean i don't know what else i they need to make like a biopic about her because she was like she's like the forest gum of anarchists like this memoir is crazy she she sat in on a lecture by freud she was pen pals with oscar wilde she met helen keller at one point she was basically enlisted into the by Lenin into this like Soviet archival project to basically go around revolutionary Russia and like archive the, like the czarist stuff like to, like went across Russia and to all these like cathedrals and castles and help archive like the the pre-revolution Russian era. Voltaire Declare. I very much like Voltaire and Declare, especially her advocacy of anarchism without adjectives. Because, I mean, little has changed. There's so much infighting in the anarchist movement. And it's really, it's kind of encouraging to like read Voltaire and Declare and Emma Goldman and realize that they were having the same arguments a hundred years ago. And I don't know, it's like, it's kind of encouraging, like, but it's also like, wow, we really haven't moved anywhere. We're having the meetings. <laughs> This lightning round was taken from the last episode of 2020, where we discussed state formation and how nonviolence protects the state. Here's Peter Gelderlohs. Academia. Um, I, I think it's a useful tool for people who recognize that it is a very important part of the power structure we're fighting against. So if they're going to get resources, if they're going to do research, for struggles that make our struggles uh, smarter and more effective, uh, then you know, good. But just you know, be aware of the privileges involved, and and you know, don't 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 stand in front. Uh, and if you know people are doing it so that they can come and study our movements, um, fuck off. <laughs> All right, veganism. Uh, I guess the big question is 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 it a you know a, a diet that someone is doing to um, because personally that's how they feel healthiest and and best with the world. Or is it something that they're trying to impose on everyone else with no idea of uh, how potentially colonialistic that is uh, or all of the, um, the potential overlap with green capitalism, uh, seeing as how, you know, plenty of progressive political parties in like the United Nations even have been, uh, have been promoting veganism. Exarchia. A uh, beautiful neighborhood, a beautiful history of struggle. They seem a difficult time, a lot of uh, police repression, all power to them. Municipalism. Seems to me that uh, that democracy started out as a as a system intimately connected to patriarchy and and slavery, and uh, you know as a democratic system, it worked perfectly fine with groups of like thirty thousand, fifty, sixty thousand people. So to me, it seems uh, fairly naive. All right, whiteness. Fuck it, destroy it. It's terrible. It's uh, it's poison. Yeah, I mean, it's not something that, you know, you can just walk away from, but uh, hopefully everyone who has been saddled with whiteness is, is doing what they can to understand where it comes from and uh, what results it has and, and you know, doing our best to betray it. And, you know, all all power to everyone who's who's on the other side of that fucking razor wire fence and, uh, and, and fighting against it because it's an assault on their very freedom, dignity, and survival. Burn it down.
All right, so good job on the lightning round. The anarchist police will not be coming to your door. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed this installment of the show. If you liked this episode, be sure to check out our full catalog at nonserviummedia.com or at youtube.com slash nonserviummedia. And make sure to subscribe to receive notifications each time we release a new episode. If you're interested in seeing this project continue, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. And if you can't contribute financially, you can help us out simply by liking and sharing this episode. As usual, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project going. Finally, be sure to keep an eye out for the next episode. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.